<laughs> we have three roles at the College of Complexes, uh, one fool at a time, no personal attacks, and during the question and answer period, it must be a question, like a sentence that ends in a question mark, because you're asking an inquiry. Uh, our forum, we start off with announcements, then the main speaker talks for 45 minutes to an hour, and then uh, we have a question and answer period, and then we have the uh, infamous rebuttal session. This is Andy Anderson. Andy's going to come around and collect three dollars from everybody. Our waitress is Heather. Please tip her. She works for us. Main talk. Uh, the speaker tonight will be Timothy Bulger, Toastmaster, videographer, Thorium activist, and friend of the College of Complexes. Well, I think tonight, Karina's going to be doing most of the work. She's going to be taping me tonight. And uh, what I want to do is uh, I want to talk about tonight electricity. How much do we use? How, how do we get it? And how much more will we need? I advocate that the use of thorium as a pri new primary energy source. <clears throat> this is it. a lot with heavy video tonight, so I do have speakers here, and we can adjust the volume. The thing is, what is the grid? What are we paying comment for? And how much do we get for wind and solar? How much natural gas in there? And what about clean coal that Trump wants? <laughs> the first thing, the points I'm going to cover tonight. Why we need electricity? What is the grid? What powers the grid? Energy source by type? And why I think molten salt reactors are the solution. That'll cover no more than about eight minutes of the speech. And then I'll summarize, wrap up, and we'll uh, go on from there. Why do we need electricity? I mean, really, you know, we, we, we use it all, all the time. We have it for a light reduction in labor, entertainment, transportation, and the communication, plus another plethora of uses. We uh, take it for granted today. When the power goes out, we will miss it. And I can tell you, when my power goes out and my computers go down, I'm almost living blind sometimes. But then, of course, you get a candle and a good book, and that's what they did for centuries. As a matter of fact, one of your, one of your most anti-nuclear advocates, Helen Caldicott, has said, why do we need all this extra stuff, the doors that go and the, we, they, we got along with candlelight perfectly all right for years, but there's a reason we have electricity. And that's prosperity. Huh. I'm going to let Robert Hargraves, another one who wrote a book on coal, talk about it. Let's look for a minute at prosperity and population. These are data from the U.S. Central Intelligence Agency. Each dot represents a separate nation on the horizontal axis, Sorry. children per woman, on the vertical axis, GDP per capita. Nations with the most births per woman are really the poorest ones. Population scientists say about 2.3 children per woman leads to a stable population. And if we just draw that on the graph and look at it, it's the wealthier nations that have a stable or reducing population. The United States birth rate is about equal to that that would cause no growth. U.S. population growth is principally by immigration. So how can we fix this? Well, let's look at prosperity for a second. I arbitrarily define prosperity to be about $7,500 per year. That's according that to line seems to differentiate pretty well between those nations that have stable populations and those that have growing populations. Interestingly, that's about the same GDP per capita as China is today. Prosperity depends strongly on energy. Again, CIA data, uh, annual kilowatt hours per capita. The U.S. is off the charts at about 12,000 per year. That's an average energy consumption rate for electricity in the U.S. of almost 1,500 watts on average. Places in Africa have electric consumption less than 100 watts per capita. It's pretty clear that somewhere around 
2,000 kilowatt hours a year is a break-even point for achieving prosperity using electric power. Now, electric power is not the only way to achieve prosperity. You need education, property rights, rule of law, medicine, and so on. But electric power is critical to prosperity because it's the type of energy that is necessary for cooling, for heating, for water purification, for sewage processing, for medicine, for communications, for industry, for transportation. All those things depend upon electric power. All the developing nations know this. They wish to increase their energy use. And so you see, the non-OECD nations are projected to have the most growth in energy over the next few decades. And uh, how is electricity distributed? It's called a grid. And that, and that is how its power is distributed from the generator to the end user. I have another video coming up now that's going to explain exactly what the grid is and how it works. There you can see real quick just a brief overview of generators, transformers, transmission lines, substations to lower voltage to send it to residential customers, industrial customers, and commercial customers. Let's take a look and see how it works. through which power is generated, transmitted, and distributed to consumers. The electric grid is broadly made up of three main components, generation, transmission or distribution, and consumption. There are several key pieces of infrastructure that are built to support the delivery of electricity to consumers. It is comprised of these components. Generating plants, where electricity is produced. Transmission lines, infrastructure that allows electricity to be transported over long distances. Substations, where electricity voltage is increased or decreased. Transformers, the mechanisms that actually increase or decrease the electricity voltage. Distribution lines, infrastructure similar to transmission lines but for lower voltages of electricity. The grid was created to solve the problem of geographic separation between electricity production and consumption. Electricity is often produced far from where it is used, so infrastructure needs to be built to connect the two. Prior to the invention of the modern grid, electricity producers each developed their own distribution systems for delivering electricity to customers. This system was costly and often led to underused infrastructure and wasted electricity. The modern grid was invented to allow various producers to share infrastructure for production and distribution, which led to increased reliability and lower costs. So how exactly does the grid work? After electricity is generated, the voltage is stepped up at a substation. This voltage increase allows electricity to travel long distances while minimizing the amount of electricity lost. The electricity then travels along transmission lines, either overhead or underground. Once it reaches its destination, another substation steps the voltage down to a level suitable for distribution lines that deliver electricity to consumers. The electrical grid provides electricity to various consumers with varying needs. For instance, industrial consumers are large facilities like manufacturing plants. Commercial consumers are office buildings or high-rise towers. And residential consumers are individual homes. The electrical grid is one of the most important inventions in our modern world. The centralized nature of the grid has made it an ideal structure for large-scale electricity production. However, some of the grid's infrastructure is outdated and is not capable of accommodating small-scale electricity generation technologies. The smart grid is this generation's answer to the electrical grid's shortcomings. The smart grid is simply the electrical grid enhanced by information technology. This turns the electrical grid into an intelligent network that allows for real-time information about electricity production and consumption and more efficient incorporation of small-scale electricity generation sources. As the electricity power supply mix changes, the demands on the grid for reliability, efficiency, and cost effectiveness will continue to be a complex challenge. So that's the electrical grid.
There you have it. Where does our power come from? Well, in the Chicagoland area, it was Samuel Insull in the 20s who basically made our electrical grid. And, you know, he was a character because he did get caught up in stock manipulation later on in the 30s. But the first generating station was in Niagara Falls, and it was put in by Nikola Tesla to distribute power to the city of Buffalo. And they were the first ones to centralize power. There was at one point a war of the currents between Thomas Edison and Nikola Tesla because transformers run on AC, and with DC power, which is what Edison advocated, you would have had to have had a generating station every five or six miles. So, where does our power come from? Let's find out. Comet energy sources are about 44% uh, coal, 40% nuclear, 12% natural gas, and 4% from sustainable resources like wind and solar and hydroelectric power. And yes, there is a hydroelectric power plant in the Chicago area. That's on the INM Canal at one of their locks and it's located in Lockport. It's a good place to go see if you want to take a look at something like that. But anyway, let's find out further about energy sources. Here's the capacity of power plants in the Chicago area itself. They have the South East Chicago Energy Project, which basically goes on natural gas. And it has a capacity of about 296 megawatts. The Calumet Energy Natural Gas Plant at about 300 29 megawatts. Fisk Petroleum at 196 megawatts. And then, of course, two coal plants, which they're planning on shutting down inside the city limits, which was Fisk at 326 megawatts and, and Crawford Coal, which was 532 megawatts. My information may be a little bit outdated because this was probably done about five or six years ago. Both are shut down. Both are shut down? Yeah. Okay. The coal, the fifth coal and the Crawford coal? Yeah. Right. But there's still quite a bit still here in Illinois. So where exactly does the city of Chicago's power come from? The majority is from coal and nuclear energy, according to the 2011 Comet Environmental Disclosure Statement, which measures energy consumption in the city from October 1st, 2010 to September 30th, 2011. 44% came from coal, 40% from nuclear, 12% from natural gas, and the remaining 4% came from sustainable sources such as solar wind, biomass, and hydropower. By the way, that hydropower comprises about half of the so-called renewable resources. ComEd provides power for 3.8 million customers in Northern Illinois and roughly 7% of the state's population. Let's take a further look with this next video. When you turn on the lights in your house, or plug in your smartphone charger, or even charge your electric car, do you know where your power is coming from? Electricity is something we don't think about very often until we don't have it, or the cost of it goes way up. In the United States, there are a number of different sources of energy. The biggest sources of energy are fossil fuels like coal and natural gas. Together, they account for two thirds of the electricity we use. Nuclear power, which is the third biggest source, accounts for almost 20%. And at the smaller end of the scale, hydropower, which comes from things like the Hoover Dam, is responsible for 7% of power generation. Wind power accounts for 4%, and solar for less than 1%. We don't just use electricity at home. Businesses and factories all use electricity to make goods and provide services. When they have cheap electricity, it results in lower costs on products we buy, and the boost can help create more jobs. Depending on what part of the country you live in, the mix of energy sources can look very different. If you live in the Midwest, you likely get more than 65% of your electricity from coal. If you live in the Northwest, the biggest source of electricity is hydropower. And if you live in the Northeast, you get the bulk of your electricity from natural gas and nuclear. So when you hear that people want to raise the cost of using fossil fuels to make electricity and force people to switch to even more expensive options like wind and solar, realize that it will have a very real effect on your pocketbook and the economy. And if the switch to renewables is too fast, we could even get to the point where the costs could skyrocket or there isn't enough power to go around. For more information on how government policies affect you personally, go to informationstation.org. Anyway, 
the thing is, we are getting the majority still from fossil fuels, natural gas and coal. The thing is, in a brief 20-year period, when nuclear was being developed, we now have it at about 20% of our own power. Now, I'm not saying that the present light water reactor is the best in the world, but there are some other sources. What I'm going to be doing next is going a little bit more into coal and some of the other sources of power. And again, I'm using a lot of videos to explain what they do and how they work. Here is the next one. This is from Canada, by the way. The huge building you see behind me is one of Ontario Power Generation's fossil fuel generating stations. This one uses coal. Other fossil fuel generating stations use oil and natural gas to make electricity. In essence, it's a factory that converts the energy from burning coal into a flow of electrons, or what is commonly called electricity. The electricity that powers the province. Coal is shipped to the station by freighter or train, where it's then transferred to the coal yard. There, large machines called tractor scrapers arrange the coal into storage piles. A series of conveyors transports the coal into the plant, where it passes through enormous pulverizers that grind the coal into a fine powder prior to burning. The pulverized coal is fed into a large industrial furnace that is surrounded by boiler tubes filled with water. The intense heat from the burning coal heats the water in the boiler tubes and turns it into steam. The steam is transferred under pressure at high speed through large pipes to turbines like these. It's this pressure and flow that pushes the blades of the turbine, causing it to spin. The turbine is connected to a generator that contains a rotor. Thank you. Large electromagnets are attached to the rotor that is located within coils of copper wire called the stator. As the generator rotor spins, a flow of electrons is created in the stator. This produces electricity that can be stepped up in voltage through the station transformers and sent from the station across transmission lines. The steam from the turbine is condensed back to water using cooling water from the lake and pumped back to the boiler where it is reheated to continue the process. There you go. There is Trump and several advocates of the coal industry are advocating the use of clean coal. What about clean coal? Is it really clean or is it just another gimmick to uh, keep it going? Our next video is going to explain a little bit more about it. Coal is one of the most relied on energy sources in the world, but it's also one of the dirtiest fossil fuels. Now a groundbreaking Canadian technology may change that, and that could mean the world's biggest energy consumers will be able to cut carbon emissions. CCTV's Chris Tia has more. It fueled the Industrial Revolution, remains the planet's number one source of power, but coal is the biggest contributor to global CO2 emissions. With carbon reduction targets set around the globe, coal will have to clean up its act. A challenge for power companies and governments everywhere. Coal has suffered a bad reputation as being a dirty type of fossil fuel, but power stations like this one are starting to harness technology to make the burning process much cleaner to give coal a new lease of life. Yeah. Every aspect of the entire operation is controlled right out of the control room. The Boundary Dam Power Plant in Saskatchewan is home to the world's first working clean coal technology. Thanks to a process called carbon capture and storage, 90% of carbon dioxide and 100% of sulfur can be secured and stopped from entering the atmosphere. We've got an abundant supply of um, low-cost uh, coal right on our doorstep, and we really want to continue to make use of that resource. This project uh, is a game-changer. What's happening in this building really could change the way the world burns coal. This is the carbon capture plant, and it's where sulfuric acid and carbon dioxide are extracted from the coal burning process, and those byproducts are then sold on the open market. So not only is this carbon capture plant helping protect the environment, it's also helping the company make more money.
There is some controversy over where this liquefied CO2 goes. Most from this plant is sold to oil drillers who use it for enhanced oil recovery, a sort of fracking for oil. Some environmentalists say that's just passing on the potential to pollute elsewhere. There's also concern about leakage when the CO2 is sent deep underground for long-term storage. This well goes nearly 3.4 kilometers straight down. Research is ongoing to see whether CO2 can be stored underground and underwater safely, and what happens while it's down there. We're able then to sample it and see how the changes to the fluid you know, might be happening, and also it will give us information on how the CO2 has migrated, at what concentrations, at what saturation the CO2 has reached the well. Thousands more facilities like Andrew Dams are needed to make a dent in global emissions. So far, just 55 projects are in existence worldwide. Most of them are in the US, China, or Canada, but other countries are looking. China, Norway, uh, Australia, any country that has coal is interested in what we're doing because it really is a lens into the future. And then we have countries that are emerging that simply can't afford to build a nuclear impact or go into renewables in a big way, so they have a, a large source of coal. A United Nations report claims China and the U.S. must work closely on carbon capture development. Almost all coal and gas plants in China will need carbon capture if the world is to reduce its carbon footprint. Christian Yeo, CCTV, Boundary Dam, Saskatchewan, Canada. There you have it clean coal. Here's the thing. What does Trump mm -hmm. think about clean coal? He digs coal. Maybe he's a little bit more old-fashioned than we'd like to. But here is a quick excerpt from a State of the Union address last year. In our drive to make Washington accountable, we have eliminated more regulations in our first year than any administration in the history of our country. <laughs> We have ended the war on American energy, and we have ended the war on beautiful, clean coal. We are now very proudly an exporter of energy to the world. America has also finally turned the page on decades of unfair trade deals that sacrificed our prosperity and shipped away our companies, our jobs, and our wealth. Our nation has lost its wealth, but we're getting it back so fast. The era of economic surrender is totally over. Believe you me. Okay. The next source of power is uh, natural gas. And it's done via, fo via the fossil fuels way in the previous video, but more common now is it's done via a beaker plant using a gas turbine engine to drive a generator. To give us a little bit more background on the natural gas plants, let's take a look at this next video. Natural gas is an important component to Hoosier Energy's generation portfolio. We currently own and operate two natural gas-fired generating facilities, also known as peaking plants. The Worthington and Lawrence County generating stations. These facilities offer a valuable physical hedge against market volatility and can provide a source of regional reliability reserves. Both facilities employ General Electric's LM6000 aero derivative gas turbines. The quick dispatch capability can have units online at full load in 13 minutes and it can generate a combined output of 460 megawatts. Compressed natural gas is delivered to the facility via a pipeline. The LM6000s use natural gas and compressed air in the combustion section of the gas turbine. Those hot gases are extracted on the power turbine that converts mechanical energy that rotates a generator at 3600 RPM, creating 13.8 kilovolts. 
which then flows to generator step-up transformers that increase the power to 161 kilovolts. The power then flows to the switchyard where it is supplied to Hoosier Energy's 18-member systems for distribution. Hoosier Energy, Indiana. What about hydroelectric? It too has its place and it's constantly put, taken as renewable energy. The thing is, hydroelectric too does have its disadvantages in like the backing up of lakes, the destruction of some species that, that might uh, be involved with, with some of the things. And you know, sometimes we are better off having the rivers flow freely than dammed up. Here is some more information in this next video about hydro. One hundred and seventy thousand cubic meters of water flow past here every minute at almost Niagara sixty Falls. kilometers per hour. That's enough water to fill about a hundred thousand Olympic swimming pools every day. Standing here, you can actually feel the power of the water. Harnessing that power is what hydroelectric stations have been designed to do for over a hundred years in Ontario. In essence, they are factories that convert the energy of falling water into the flow of electrons or what is commonly called electricity, the electricity that powers the province. Most hydroelectric stations use either water diverted around the natural drop of a river, such as a waterfall or rapids, or a dam is built across a river to raise the water level and provide the drop needed to create a driving force. Water at the higher level is collected in the forebay. It flows through the plant intake into a pipe called a penstock, which carries it down to a turbine water wheel at the lower water level. The water pressure increases as it flows down the penstock. It is this pressure and flow that drives the turbine that is connected to the generator. Inside the generator is the rotor that is spun by the turbine. Large electromagnets are attached to the rotor located within coils of copper wire called a stator. As the generator rotor spins the magnets, a flow of electrons is created in the coils of the stator. This produces electricity that can be stepped up in voltage through the station transformers and sent across transmission lines. The falling water, having <coughs> served its purpose, exits the generating station to the tail race, where it rejoins the mainstream of the river to continue the cycle of creating clean, renewable energy for Ontario. As you can see, there's still a little bit more left to go. Um, the next part we're going to talk about is wind energy. And at the first, it's on to renewables. We have wind turbines. And let's learn a little bit more about, little more about wind power in this next short video. Wind power. Wind, although it might not need explaining, is moving air caused by differences in atmospheric pressure. Wind speeds vary based on geography, topography, and season. Because of this, like other renewables, there are some locations better suited for wind energy generation than others. In fact, there are optimal wind locations both onshore and offshore. Energy is derived from wind by converting the air's motion into mechanical energy. Traditionally, this energy was used for milling grain and pumping water, but today is most commonly used to create electricity. The mechanism used to convert air motion into electricity is referred to as a turbine. A turbine is a large structure with several spinning blades, usually three. These blades are connected to an electromagnetic generator that generates electricity when the wind causes the blades to spin. Wind is becoming an increasingly important part of the global electricity supply mix. A major advantage of wind is that the production of electricity has no direct CO2 emissions. But wind generation is not without its challenges. As everyone knows, the wind does not blow all the time, causing intermittency issues for power grids. The price tag of wind power has traditionally been higher than conventional electricity generation sources, though the wind cost curve has declined significantly in recent years. NIMBY concerns such as land use, noise, and bird disruption have also been raised in certain areas. That's wind power. 
not a bad source of power, but with its intermittency, I don't think it's going to take the scale that's going to replace coal and nuclear really soon. The second renew of renewables is solar power. We're going to watch this next video to just learn a little bit more about it as a refresher for probably most of you people. Solar. Solar energy is the most abundant renewable energy source in the world. Solar energy systems employ technologies that convert the sun's heat or light to another form of energy for use. There are two categories of technologies that harness solar energy, solar photovoltaics and solar thermal. Solar photovoltaic, or PV, is a technology that converts sunlight into direct current electricity by using semiconductors. In contrast, solar thermal is a technology that utilizes the heat energy from the sun for heating or electricity production. Solar is a renewable resource and does not emit any greenhouse gases. However, efficiency and intermittency are issues. Since sunlight is dependent on location, season, and time of day, harnessing the energy from the sun is a challenge. That's solar. And you see, the thing is, is that with the intermittency issues, most solar power panels have about a 20-year lifetime, and it takes about 12 years for the energy to put into making the wind towers and the solar panels, about 12 years. After that, you do get quite a bit of, um, of, of free energy, but remember, it is variable and does have a tendency to integrate into the grid. I happen to know a guy who works at ComEd who buys the power for the systems, and he said renewables are so variable that they have to back it up with gas peaker plants that go, that, that basically are up and down in, uh, in their uh, usage. It's sort of like driving a car in the city where you get the city mileage versus driving in the country where you have a steady state. Um, you'll have with uh, the solar and wind, right now we can integrate it into the grid. But there is, I believe myself, there's only one source that is big enough and powerful enough to replace our fossil fuels. And that, of course, is nuclear. This next video is going to explain it. Nuclear energy. Nuclear energy is the energy held in the nucleus of an atom. It can be obtained by two types of reactions, fission and fusion. Nuclear fission produces energy through the splitting of atoms, which releases heat energy that can be harnessed to produce electricity. The fuel most commonly used for nuclear fission is uranium. However, other elements such as plutonium and thorium can also be used. All of today's operating nuclear plants use nuclear fission to generate electricity. The second type of nuclear energy is nuclear fusion, the same process that powers our sun. Fusion is a nuclear reaction in which atomic nuclei collide at a high speed and join to form a new type of atomic nucleus. During this process, matter is not conserved because some of the matter of the fusing nuclei is converted to photons, which produces energy. Fusion power offers the prospect of an almost inexhaustible source of energy. However, creating the conditions for nuclear fusion presents a potentially insurmountable scientific and engineering challenge. A recent experiment has shown that nuclear fusion can be achieved. However, it has not yet been successfully demonstrated on a commercial scale. Today, nuclear power plants account for 11% of global electricity generation, with about 80% of that installed capacity being in OECD countries. All of this capacity is nuclear fission. Nuclear energy, through fission, can release one million times more energy per atom than fossil fuels. Nuclear plants have large power generating capacity and low operating costs, making it ideal for base load generation. Because of its large scale and centralized nature, it can easily be integrated into electricity grids, requiring few changes to existing infrastructure. However, Upfront capital costs are intensive and present financial risks to investors given the long time frames power plants must operate to recover these costs. Nuclear energy does not emit greenhouse gas emissions. For this reason, it is often seen as a substitute for fossil fuel electricity and a solution for mitigating climate change. However, nuclear power holds a wide variety of environmental and health issues. 
The largest concern is the generation of radioactive wastes such as uranium mill tailings, spent reactor fuel, and other radioactive wastes. Some of these materials can remain radioactive and hazardous to human health and the environment for thousands of years. Several nuclear accidents in recent history have negatively impacted the environment and surrounding communities, making nuclear power a controversial topic for the general public. That's nuclear energy. There you go. Now, let's look on a little bit more of energy sources used to generate electricity in the United States. Nuclear accounts for about 20% of that power right now, and that was done in a short 20-year time frame when reactors are constructed in the 60s and 70s. There really hasn't been a new nuclear plant built since the 90s, and as you can see, we're still using natural gas and coal for the majority of our electric power. Renewable sources account for about 13%, with hydropower being about 6.1%, wind about 4.7 and solar for 0.6. In other words, we got to do a lot to get off of coal and natural gas, which is our, our fossil fuels. And as we learned earlier, the rest of the world needs to develop and, and do this well. And it's going to take an all, I think it's going to take not only the nuclear option, but an all of the above option to get our energy needs met. The U.S. energy history from about 1790 to about 2015, how much power did we use per person? As you can see, it was steadily going up well into the 20th century. By the 2000s, it went down for a little bit, and that was a result of the recession of 2008 and 2007. It stayed low as the economy recovered. So we are making some progress in this field. Now I'm going to tell you a little bit more in this next video about, about this power, where it goes. I'm sorry, worldwide one person energy use is equivalent to each person lighting 2.5 matches every second. In the U.S., our per person capacity use is equivalent to each person lighting about 10 matches every second. Renewables are not going to produce enough power. Germany recently tried to shut off its nuclear plants. Let's see what happened to Germany in this next video. We have to phase out carbon emissions at a rate of 7% a year. I don't see any way we can do that without the help of nuclear power. Si on regarde aujourd'hui le sujet du réchauffement, quelle est la, la manière de lutter contre le réchauffement climatique C'est lutter contre le CO2 qu'on émet. Ce quel est le problème Le thermique et le charbon. Elles seront fermées, les centrales, lesquelles Elles seront fermées. Toutes les centrales thermiques et à charbon en France, donc celles-là, elles seront toutes fermées parce que c'est ça qui est mauvais pour l'émission. Ensuite, le nucléaire n'est pas mauvais pour les émissions de CO2. C'est même la manière aujourd'hui, avec les renouvelables, la plus décarbonée, comme on dit, de faire de l'électricité. Look at Germany. There's a lot of data. Its progress is very slow compared with the examples of where they move to nuclear big advantage is that it is essentially carbon free energy. Ma priorité en France à l'Europe internationale, c'est les émissions de CO2 et le réchauffement. Dans ce contexte-là, ma priorité, c'est fermer les usines, les centrales dont je vous ai parlé. Si je ferme demain une centrale nucléaire en plus, c'est pas vrai que je peux la remplacer par de renouvelables. Pourquoi Parce qu'une centrale nucléaire, elle vous fournit de l'électricité de manière continue toute l'année. Le renouvelable C'est une énergie intermittente. The people who argue for our renewables think that, well, if we can go from 0% to 10% to 20% renewable, then we're on the way and then it will get easier and we'll get 100%. Well, it's actually harder, not easier, because of the intermittency of the renewables. Qu'ont fait les Allemands quand ils ont d'un seul coup fermé tout le nucléaire Ils ont développé beaucoup plus de renouvelables que nous. On a du retard, mais ils ont massivement rouvert du thermique et du charbon. Et, du charbon. et ils ont dégradé leur bilan CO2, ça n'a pas été bon pour la planète. Donc je ne ferai pas ça, je tiens ce premier engagement. You've suffered a loss of funding because of your pro nuclear position. Yeah, uh, that's pretty obvious. Was there ever a moment where you were like, maybe I need to shut up about nuclear power and <laughs> so I can get my funding back? How much renewables can do and at what cost? That will become clear over the next decade or two. But by that time, 
it may be too late. You know, so that's why we have to make the story clear as soon as possible. Anyway, my own story about advocating the use of thorium nuclear power, particularly the molten salt reactor, was basically because of the issues you've seen here. We have a lot of power to generate, and they're projecting by the next, by the end of the century, it's going to be six times more than what we're using. I still don't like a lot of the um, issues associated with the modern day nuclear power plants. I may not have liked it, but also the one of the co-inventors of the uh, present day reactors, which is a light water reactor, his name was Alvin Weinberg, who was head of the Oak Ridge National Laboratories, also agreed with me. And he talked about global warming and some of the other issues associated with nuclear power and was essentially fired by a congressman by the name of Chet Holyfield, who said to him, if you're so concerned about nuclear power, why don't you just get out of the field? Well, anyway, as I learned more about thorium, at first I was pretty skeptical. I thought that this thing could be a scam. I mean, whoa, there's a fuel that can produce every produce uh, carbon-free electricity, and it's safer and cleaner and can burn up our nuclear wastes. That's like the ASRAM of uh, something, sort of like what you'd see from the 60s from a lot of you guys. But the thing is, what I found out as I learned more and more, it was absolutely true. And uh, in this next video, it's about five minutes, it's going to explain a little bit about the advantages of thorium versus the nuclear power industry. The heavy water reactor will use about 0.7% of the uranium's energy value, and the light water reactor will use about half of 1%. They both do terrible. At normal pressures, water will boil at 100 degrees Celsius. This isn't nearly hot enough to generate electricity effectively. So water-cooled reactors have to run at over 70 atmospheres of pressure. You have to build a water-cooled reactor as a pressure vessel. The number one accident people worry about, pressure is lost. Water that's being held at 300 Celsius, flashes to steam. Its volume increases roughly by a factor of a thousand. If you don't get emergency coolant to the fuel in the reactor, it can overheat and melt. This is what drives the design of this building. So if this happens, all the steam is captured in this building. Now the reactors we have today use uranium oxide as a fuel. It's a ceramic material, chemically stable, but not very good at transferring heat. If you lose pressure, you lose your water, and soon your fuel will melt down and release the radioactive fission products within it. So they have a series of emergency systems designed to always keep the core covered with water. We saw the failure of this at Fukushima Daiichi. You know, they had multiple backup diesel generators, and each one probably had a very high probability of turning on. The tsunami came and knocked them all out. Then people sometimes say, is nuclear energy safe? And the first thing I say is, well, which one? Thousands of different ways to do nuclear energy. I'll say, is the car safe? Well, which one? I had the good fortune to learn about a different form of nuclear power, the liquid fluoride thorium reactor. We can fully burn up the thorium in this reactor versus only burning up part of the uranium in a typical light water reactor. It's not based on water cooling, and it doesn't use solid fuel. It's based on fluoride salts as a nuclear fuel. You have to heat them up to about 400 degrees Celsius to get them to melt. But that's actually perfect for trying to generate power in a nuclear reactor. Here's the real magic. They don't have to operate at high pressure. They don't have to use water for coolant, and there's nothing in the reactor that's going to make a big change in density. Unlike the solid fuels that can melt down if you stop cooling them, these liquid fluoride fuels are already melted. In normal operation, you have a little piece of frozen salt that you've kept frozen by blowing cool gas over the outside of the pipe. If there's an emergency and you lose all the power to your nuclear power plant, the little blower stops blowing, the frozen plug of salt melts, and the liquid fluoride fuel inside the reactor drains out of the vessel, through the line, and into another tank called a drain tank. In water-cooled reactors, you generally have to provide power to the plant to keep the water circulating and to prevent a meltdown. But if you lose power to the lifter, it shuts itself down all by itself without human intervention. A staggeringly impressive level of safety, even if there's physical damage to the reactor. Thorium is a naturally occurring nuclear fuel that is four times more common in the Earth's crust than uranium. It's so energy dense that you can hold a lifetime supply of thorium energy in the palm of your hand. We can use thorium about 200 times more efficiently than we're using uranium now. Because the lifter is capable of almost completely releasing the energy in thorium, this reduces the waste generated over uranium by factors of hundreds and by factors of millions over fossil fuels.
We're still going to need liquid fuels for vehicles and machinery, but we can generate these liquid fuels from the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and from water, much like nature does. We can generate hydrogen by splitting water and combining it with carbon harvested from CO2 in the atmosphere, making fuels like methanol, ammonia, and dimethyl ether, which can be a direct replacement for diesel fuels. Imagine carbon neutral gasoline and diesel, sustainable and self-produced. You can see that uranium-235 is like on par with silver and platinum. Can you imagine burning platinum for energy? And that's what we're doing with our nuclear energy sources today. We're burning this extremely rare stuff and we're not burning thorium. You know, some people are kind of environmentalists and they say, listen, nuclear power is not sustainable. We're gonna run out of uranium. Okay, I will yield that point to you if we're talking about today's nuclear technology. In 2007, we used five billion tons of coal 31 billion barrels of oil, and 5 trillion cubic meters of natural gas, along with 65,000 tons of uranium to produce the world's energy. So I have a friend who's trying to start a rare earth mine in Missouri. Jim, how much thorium do you think you'll be pulling up a year? He goes, I think about 5,000 tons. 5,000 tons of thorium would supply the planet with all of its energy for a year. And he goes, and there's like a zillion other places on Earth that are just like my mind. It's a nice mind, but it's not unique. It's not like this is the one place on Earth where this is found. Every time mankind has been able to access a new source of energy, it has led to profound societal implications. Human beings have had slaves for thousands and thousands of years. And when we learned how to make carbon our slave instead of other human beings, we started to learn how to be able to be civilized people. Thorium has a million times the energy density of a carbon-hydrogen bond. What could that mean for human civilization? Because we're not going to run out of this stuff. We will never run out. It is simply too common. There you have it. A thorium molten, and the thing is, if you guys think it's experimental, a thorium molten salt reactor was fired up for the first time in four decades. The road to cleaner, meltdown-proof nuclear power has taken a big step forward. Research, researchers at NRG, a Dutch nuclear materials firm, have begun the first tests of nuclear fission using thorium salts since experiments ended at the Oak Ridge Laboratory in the early 1970s. Nixon, that was a travesty. We should have kept innovating and we may have been in a much different position today. Here's the news release. An energy source with amazing powers to change the world. A technology promising cheap and scalable energy production. Now, thorium energy starts the journey from the theoretical to the practical, the world's first thorium molten salt reactor experiment in over 40 years has begun in Europe. NRG has put thorium molten salt inside an experimental reactor for testing. This marks the dawn of a new era in the development of thorium molten salt reactors. If Europe can consolidate its efforts, it can emerge as the new technological front. Let's power the world with clean and abundant energy. Okay, I don't have the checks yet. I'll get on. All right. We have gone through a lot of video and a lot of technical information to me about the power grid what sources of power there have been. I have not yet covered the potential hazards of the conventional type of light water reactors that we're using, because I'm sure Dennis over here is gonna remind us all of that. But for every thing that he can talk about, I can probably come up with a counter argument for the development of nuclear power. And the thing is, I will now entertain your questions and then we'll get slowly into the rebuttals. Thank you, Tim. All right, um, first, come on, you guys, you got to have questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand. Right. 
You didn't mention anything about storage of electricity. We've got lots of uh, new developments in storage. The price is coming down about the same uh, exponential rate that uh, the price of solar and wind is coming down. It will also address the issue of intermittency. Uh, how can you mention that? Probably because oh, of the time that that's involved in the speech itself. I did do some research into the intermittency. But at this point, from what my understanding is, is that we still haven't produced batteries cheap enough to really uh, address the issue of storage capacity. And with the uh, development of, of we're, we're, we're going to need it at some point because we still have peak power and everything else. I am an advocate of an all of the above strategy for uh, is there anything else that you know you want? power. Why not? But again, the reason I didn't bring up, up a lot of that issue was. It's not that it's not relevant, it's just I can't cover everything in this speech. But I am very aware of the trends you're talking about. And as a matter of fact, it's, it's amazing the breakthroughs that they're doing with the uh, technology of battery storage, as well as a few other things. Okay, next question. Jonathan. Okay, so with current energy sources we now have domestically, how much do we have to reduce our energy use if we want to go nuclear free? Just a guess. I don't need an exact number or a source. Just you're, you're what you're how much less energy would we have per day per household if we said we just have to live frugally until we find a safe energy source with the capacity of nuclear and then transition to that? The thing is, is that uh, although and I realize we, we're talking about tough love that's never well, the, the, been the, the thing before. is, you and me and other people will not reduce our energy usage because of the argument that I gave in the first video about how energy creates prosperity. <laughs> the thing is, even if we do, other countries aren't. They're developing. They want power. And the thing is, if we deploy these molten salt reactors, you know, put them on an assembly line, uh, had a few private companies come in and start running it, which there are about four right now that are actively seeking investors. We won't have to sacrifice our energy production. As a matter of fact, the more we can get, the better off we can with recycling, the better off our environment's going to be, and the better off we're going to handle a lot of that nuclear waste. Because a lot of that waste, remember, only 7% of the uranium is burned off. That could be separated. The long-term actinites can be burned off. And yes, there are some problems with thoria because you still have a little bit, you still have a radioactive source. It's about the size of a basketball after about 30 years of operation to power an entire city. And it has to be sequestered for about 400 years. And I believe we can do that. It's certainly a lot less waste than you'd see with the carbon fuels. Okay, Charlie. I see according to the chart that you pre presented that Thorium is a, if you want, a, it's an adjacent element to uranium. It's a radioactive element. The radioactive elements, as we know, going back to Madame Curie, are not safe. I'll use, I'll be use that one. So you're recommending an energy system that is not safe. How do you claim it's safe? How do you make radio something radioactive safe? So I don't understand. Tell me how specifically you yeah. make something that is radioactive safe. Simple. Thorium has a half life of about the half life of about the age of the universe. And so until then, if you encounter it. Is it safe or dangerous? You can hold a piece of thorium in your hand, Charlie, and not severe Radio activity is Let him safe answer now. the question, Charlie. Charlie, you, you know, the thing is, is if we want an advanced industrial society... What happened to Madame Curie? Charlie, Madame Curie was, was can basically... Can you please answer the question? Okay, so well, the question is... Well, he's not is, answering the damn question. All right, how do you make well, it... Don't yell at me if he doesn't answer the question. I'll all right, it Charlie. Made safe. I is it safe? No, the no, question no. is, is it safe? Have you ever heard of background radiation, Charlie? No, but answer the question. I'm is going it... to answer the question. There's a... The, with radiation, it's all around us. And there is background radiation in the atmosphere itself. 
If you're on a beach in Brazil, in the high mountain areas, you're going to get a lot more radiation than you will here. And it's safe because our bodies are used to a certain level. I guarantee you a high level dosage is dangerous. I guarantee you that with exposure to uranium or some of the other actinides, it is a dangerous proposition. Thorium has waste problems. Like I said, it is a building that's got a nuclear reactor inside. It is going to be radioactive. But the thing is, a lot of the stuff that's, when you burn it up properly, it still needs to be sealed for about 400 years. And it's no problem, I Charlie. I you it was safe. No, it's, it's so, Charlie, it's Finally, definitely a lot safer answer. than burning our atmosphere with carbon, and which is exactly what's going to happen. You see, Charlie, this story of revolution is going to happen no matter whether we like it or not. China right now, the son of the past president heads up their thorium project in China. And he, uh, they're on their way to becoming the molten salt vendor. That's because China has no uranium. Uh, well, they have thorium and uh, th burning thorium is a lot better. You see, it's not so much the burning of thorium. What, it, what thorium does is when it's bombarded with free neutrons, it converts itself into uranium-233. And it's the uranium-233 that does the fusion reaction. Fission, but, fission. I mean the fission reaction, you're right. Um, but with the type of reactor that it gets involved with, and the way that the molten salt reactor does, it recovers a lot of the long-term actinides and basically burns them up so you don't have this 100,000 year radiation. And you've you got to remember, Charlie, the dangerous radiations are the ones with the short half-lives, not the long-term hey, ones. I totally, I give up. Go yeah. on the next one. He's talking about the ambient radiation is dangerous, but then it's dangerous for four. Which one is it? Charlie? Hey, you're talking two sides, two different sides of your mouth. Come on, Timmy. Question. Oh, okay. it's, just, it's just like the rug. Next over. question. All right. Pick one. Let's yes, ma'am. Um, my first question is, uh, why do you think that uranium-233 is not an extremely dangerous waste product in this process? Thorium has a half-life about the same as the age of the universe, and as such, it can't possibly produce power. So it has to uh, absorb a neutron and turn into uranium-233, right. Right. and uranium-233 is fissionable. Right. And the leftover uranium-233 from this process is very radioactive, and it, produce, and it presents a problem of storage that is very similar, although maybe not as long-lived, as the problem we already have. So my question is, why do you think we can handle that kind of a waste problem and we're not going to be able to develop a way of storing electricity so that uh, we'll have electricity available when the sun isn't shining and the wind isn't blowing. Well, to be honest with you, the uranium-233 in a molten salt reactor is almost 100% burned up. Now, I'm not saying that there's not waste products because there is waste products at the end of the cycle. But a lot of those waste products can actually be used for medical devices and medical issues such as cancer treatment and other areas on it. And the other point of that is, is that um, it's safer because of the liquid fluoride technology. If we were running uranium-235 reactors on that same technology, you'd find some similar benefits of the uranium being burned up all, all, the, all the time, a lot less long-term actinides from, you think, remember, the thorium molten salt reactor is a really different revolutionary design from the, from the light water reactor. <coughs> the reason why we have light water reactors is basically because of Admiral Rickover. He designed one for the use in a submarine. The Navy knows water, so they would know how to handle a uh, water-cooled reactor. They don't. They didn't know how to do a uh, one with thorium. And remember <laughs> that a lot of this technology was available in the 60s, and they were actively working on it. 
Now, I am not advocating uh, there's downsides to the thorium reactor problem because it does have radioactive waste. It will need to be sequestered, and the recommended time is about 400 years. But a 30-year time with about a basketball size of waste powering the north side of the city of Chicago probably can be dealt with a lot easier than the carbon that we're going to be burning than the <coughs> solar and wind that's going to be the entire big infrastructure. You're talking the entire state of Arizona, roughly, needing to be covered along with the transmission lines to cover our <coughs> to cover our renewable energy. I mean, to cover the amount that the United States would need for renewable energy. Now, again, I am not saying that these power sources are bad. Hey, if we could power the world on it, I'd be all for it, but I just don't see how we can do it given the amount of power that we'll need. It's still the best source for low waste. Yes, it's radioactive. Yes, it's dangerous. But if it's stored properly, put into a, a sequestered for 400 years, which I believe we can do, we can definitely make sure that, that, that these reactors will be the best way. And besides, okay, anyway, our next question. Please. Next question. Sid. Uh, I don't feel any. Could you, do you know anything about fusion? Fusion? And, uh, I understand it's the best thing, but I don't know much about it. The gentleman? Um, fusion's the same power source that the sun uses. And you have to have incredible pressure to get hydrogen atoms to fuse. And what they're trying to do now is they can, all, at this point, the, I think the biggest reactor is called a Tokomak right now, and they blast a small bit of energy from the uh, hydrogen atoms in there. But I don't think they've come up with the reaction yet that will give you more out than what you put in. Right now they use a stream of laser beams. And in many ways, what they have done is, it's another 20 years out, it's another 20 years out, it's another 20 years out. They're making progress, but as of right now, there's not, fusion's not going to be practical for another maybe 30 to 40 years. The thing I like about the thorium molten salt reactors, they've already done a lot of experimentation on it. Right now there's investments from Wall Street companies bringing it in to make it commercially viable. And I think it can be a good way to replace what we have uh, for, from coal and oil. All right. Uh, Next question. Uh, pick one, Andy. Uh, uh, Ellen. Okay, so, you know, it's still got a, there's got to be a lot of safety testing. Um, it's got to meet a lot of regulations. Don't you think this could take uh, 20 or more years to get online? And that's why it's not most of the research is being done out of the United States for that very reason, that we do have a lot of regulations. Canada is making probably the most progress on this, as well as China. And the thing that really scares me is that uh, once China gets it done, they're going to have to license the technology. We're already uh, into hot with the Chinese. Now just imagine what's going to happen if they have the proprietary information on the molten salt reactors. Oh, but yeah. they can get things done too as well because of the nature of their communist system. And I think the first commercially viable molten salt reactor is going to be three to five years of being done, at least proven practically. Now it's going to have to get a lot of regulatory hurdles. Like I said, we are talking about radiation. We are talking about storage of radiation. We are talking about a, 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 about a small volume of waste material. But if we're going to want an advanced industrial civilization, we're going to have to pay the price somewhat. And we're not going to be, and, and if we don't do this in the United States, somebody else will. It's only, it's only a matter of time before this becomes commercially viable. Question. All right, Andy. Uh, do you envision uh, millions of little thorium plants in everybody's home and business, or is it one big central plant like taking the place of a current nuclear power or a big coal station? Are they going to be central? It depends on where it's at. You can, like I said, you can put 
Basically, a thorium power about the size of this restaurant could power the entire north side of the city and have about a basketball size of waste at the end of 30 years before they have to replace the uh, fuel inside my, it. My question, Tim, is we've, uh, it's been in the news, you know, Russia's been right. hacking into our system. Uh, internet hackers cause uh, tremendous damage. What kind of power outage are you going to have if somebody disables a thorium plant and shuts it down for a month? Basically, what will happen What, what would be the backup to it? The smart grid, which you're talking about now. I mean, if a plant goes out anywhere in the country, it, it can affect power for a while. But usually, with the introduction of information technology, advanced switching capabilities, it'll make electrical power more resilient like the Internet is. It'll find another path. But it's going to take a lot of investment to do it. And what, what I'm trying to tell you is that I think I envision first a lot of the thorium reactors just coming in and taking the place in the same spots as coal and nuclear do. I mean coal and natural gas now because you know, it's sort of almost like a plug and play system. And then as we get more things, they might start being used as peaker plants or other things. I am not saying that uh, it's not going to happen, but I think it's going to be a significant thing. If you want a thorium reactor, you can build one that will fit on the back of a truck to provide power. Question. Yeah. Back in the corner there. Yeah. Steve. Mike. 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 You know, Tim, uh, politicians and, and McConnell and Congress and Trump are all bought and paid for by Wall Street, big oil, big natural gas. Coal. How do you, you know, they don't want, they don't want this stuff. They want us to burn coal and natural gas and oil. They, they, it's Wall Street money. That's <coughs> money. They don't want this no question, Well, I think a lot of stuff, what you're talking about, when companies start forming and you start getting active investors, it may be Wall Street. But you've got to remember, too, that the majority of the electrical grid that was built in the United States was through the power of stocks. Bonds and yeah, street the, money. They don't want natural gas to burn them off the coal in huh? the hills. Yes. Lots of oil they corn. The thing they, is, is, you know, they, it's, it's huge. They're it is huge, but uh, I think that once, if, if you can get thorium cheaper than coal, that's what they're going to use. I don't think it's, you know, they don't look yes. at um, There was a stock that was just issued last week, Bloom Energy. They yes. make fuel cells. Anybody call it up on that yet? Um, it's not. Um, I know it's not nuclear. I know what fuel cells are. Yeah, I mean it's and, not clean, but um, yeah, but it, 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 it's it, stable. Yeah, and a fuel cell's been used for years, yeah. and like the you know that's how they generate electricity on a lot of the uh, rockets. And I do know that I didn't do a lot of research on fuel cells, but I do know how they work, which is basically they take generate power through like either hydrogen or some other element and I'm a little unfamiliar with how they work but I do know what a fuel cell is and they too as the price comes down are a little bit more efficient than the internal combustion engine because you are using electricity and an electric motor is about 90% efficient versus about the 60 or 40% efficiency of the <laughs> internal combustion engine. Okay? Uh, next question. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> this is a very portable uh, type of material. And uh, my dirty mind asks, are there any terrorist or other kinds of uh, things we should worry about uh, in terms of, I mean, what, what about what about terrorists? Can they use this to wreak havoc here? Can the Chinese or the Russians or the North Koreans use this to wreak havoc? Uh, most forms of energy start with a very positive, uh, benign type of thing, and behold, sooner or later, we're going to find ways to kill uh, 600,000 people with it. Um, do we need to worry about this here, or am I being paranoid? Oh. Uh, being I don't think you're being paranoid, but the proliferation <laughs> risk of uranium-233, that, that is a very radioactive type of material. 
and what is usually <coughs> mixed with some very nasty stuff that if you took and you went into a molten salt reactor while it's operational, so you're going to be dead by that six hours. <laughs> come that way okay? yeah, that's and that, that's the downside, you know, but unless the terrorist wants to kill himself, <laughs> and find a way, and the electronics are going to be fried if it gets in, into this environment, um, that's going to keep down the proliferation risks. The big thing that worries me is they could use as a dirty bomb, like they can with uranium and other things. But what's safe about the reactor itself is that when the stuff goes bad, it goes into a drain tank, and it just sits there and, and, and it doesn't. The thing is, with a molten salt reactor, you have to keep the reaction going, and. And it's not like trying to keep it from going, running away in a meltdown, like in the molten salt reactor. Yes, it is a risk. Um, but I, I think with effective controls, and of course with uh, with the effective controls and proper security, I, I, I really don't see any other way of getting off of coal and oil. You know, it's either we fry the planet or we have to deal with a little bit more... Uh, risk with terrorists but let me put it this way when you put gas in your car do you think about how much data all that could make you know that you know that's the other thing to do it okay Mr. Jonathan, you got a question Tim, uh, the claim that there exists on earth a thing known as clean coal i find highly dubious um I would be comfortable with you saying slightly less polluting coal that does exist but I'm still not convinced by anything I've ever heard, read, seen, including your presentation tonight, that we have something that could be designated by science as clean in regards to coal. And frankly, I agree. And did you know that the stuff that comes out of a coal chimney with the uh, naturally occurring radiation is actually worse than that nuclear reactor? That's one another reason why I'm advocating the use of, of this, this source. It's not the panacea or the end all, the end all, but it is probably the most efficient, the most practical way that I can see about dealing with climate change, global warming, and other things. Because these things can, this can go up. I wouldn't be plopping down. 500 bucks to attend a Thorium Energy Alliance conference <laughs> unless I thought it was very versatile. I remember last year that when I went down there, I'm sorry, I'm getting off point. I don't like clean coal. I think it's, I think it's uh, uh, another one of those uh, things that's uh, giving to us by what we call the BS artist. Has anyone not asked the question yet? Yeah. Yes. Yes, I've also heard that they're right now building new uh, Conventional, the, the modern nuclear right. plant, and there's been some good breakthroughs in the fusion. You know, you're, you're right on that because um, we're finally beginning to innovate in this area again. What Fukushima should have told us was that the older technology is not working, and what we should have been doing is going full scale innovation on nuclear power. The AP-1000 is designed from the 90s. It's still a light water reactor, and you're still going to have the problems with the only 7% of the uranium being burned. Yeah, it's just a more modern. It's a more modern thing, and it's going to be less susceptible to accidents like what happened at Fukushima, or Three Mile Island, or even um, <coughs> or even uh, the one in Russia. Chernobyl. Uh, Chernobyl. Um, those reactors were not designed well. The first time we had an accident, which was a very low release of radiation, was Three Mile Island. And the public, by nature, should have, is and has been concerned about it because when something goes wrong with these technology, uh, it can have some catastrophic results. The thorium reactors, though, are not in the same way have that same risk because it of the molten salt configuration of the liquids, the drain tank they have in there for the it can't melt down and it operates at atmospheric pressure, which means you don't need emergency coolant to the reactor itself. 
Okay. All right. How many um, more questions? To any me? more? Right now it's okay. uh, 747. So Let's, Andy? Uh, I'll tell you what. I'm sure we can go on with this all night long. I would like to hear your rebuttals tonight. And I'm sure your guys are going to blast away. So let's get to it. And uh, okay. I look forward to hearing from all of you. Okay, give Tim a hand. I want to handle maybe a couple more questions. Or? Yeah, why? why I'm sorry. You have one more question, Charlie. Where did this, where did this start? Hey, we always went round one. And then we started the second round. Well, we're getting close to rebuttal time, Charlie. It happens every week, though. No, no, it's about 10 minutes to 8, Charlie. I've never seen this before. Three more questions. All right. You first, ma'am. Uh, you know, you're calling it a molten salt reactor, a, a molten salt cooled reactor. And I think it's amazing to hear about how hot molten salt has to be. But I always thought they were called a liquid sodium cooled uh, reactor. Liquid sodium, sodium is another, is a liquid metal. Yeah. Okay. A, a salt. And yeah, this is really a salt, huh? Yeah, it's a salt. salt. And what they do is they put in the thorium in the form of salts, and they have the cooling stuff in there as salts. And I wish I could get into how it works tonight, but there are, there is a video by a seventh grader. She goes about uh, 15 minutes into how they work. Hmm? It's on YouTube. There's and I, I'm not saying, you know, I strongly encourage you to just go online and check it out. It took me a good four months to understand the technology myself when I first got into it. So it, it's not complicated, but it does require, you know, basically, you, anyway. All I'm going to say is there are women. Okay, Charlie, and then Dennis. Charlie, you Dennis, and then the, the, There were private investment in thorium. But I was also informed by a senator that the United States government won't invest taxpayer money in these type of schemes and that people show up all the time at Congress uh, and they don't they don't you know, appropriate money for this kind of stuff. Yeah, Charlie, our government probably won't because of the regulation. But the, the other side is the solar and the other seems to be industries which are off and rolling Charlie, and getting investments as well well okay. they're they're getting investments as well and there is a place for wind and solar i never i'm not condemning the technology what i'm simply saying it's not going to produce enough power to get us off oil and fossil fuels We're you're going to need large-scale peak power why does the United States Department of Energy invest in thorium? Because the United States Department of Energy is basically a backward thinking organization oh. that won't. They were the ones that canceled the Oak Ridge. I'm sorry, at that time it was the Atomic Energy Commission. They were the ones that canceled the molten salt program at Oak Ridge. And it was far less than what they were doing with other types of reactors at the time. Uh, the Clinch River Project, which was supposed to be a fast breeder reactor. They spent billions on it and canceled that, too. Final question, Dennis Nelson. Okay. Uh, back in the 1950s, uh, nuclear power was called supposed to be too cheap to meter. In fact, it was uh, set here in Chicago. And now look at the higher cost for nuclear. And looking in the thorium business, all I there's the hype is just unbelievable. I mean, that basically that's what the question is. This thing is, I'm correct in saying you got to be very specific, Tim, when you make statements. And we've had these below the radar emails that this reactor is experimental. This is all an experimental stage. This is what I've been saying all along. It's an experimental stage, but oh, we can do this and we can do that and we can do everything. You know, to me, isn't that just a bunch of hype right now? No, because when you look at the Thorium Energy Alliance conference videos, you're going to find a lot of a lot of people with, within three to five years of developing a practical one. I even a said commercially that, operating reactor in three to five years. That's what I've been hearing. Uh, yes. uh, but you the know, the, jury's they, up, the jury the jury's out on that one. Really. It might be, it but is. they were going to the, this 
Victoria, according to Richard Martin, in a book called Superfuel. I know what it is. No. I know what it is. You're just believing it's a bunch of hype. Yeah, I don't. It is. I think, I think saying thorium is superfuel is a fraud. Because it's fertile, not fissionable, and you need uranium right. or plutonium to jump start it. Yes. What if you put in a reactor to sit there forever? So it's a good lead into our rebuttal right. session. Yeah. Okay. Dennis? Thanks for the comments. Please enlighten us more at the rebuttal period. I really appreciate you guys again tonight. No slaughter of a hostile audience. Thank you again. And I hope you learned something about the electric grid, too. Okay. Can we take a quick head count and see how many people want to give a rebuttal? Charlie's one over there, one on this side, Dennis two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, go in the try four minutes, uh, brief hard if you can. We'll start with four minutes, thanks. Very good. Yeah, I'm a non-science person, but I've learned a lot. It's all right. Hey, ah, uh, we'll turn off that projector. Okay. You get the last word. Surely you guys have got uh, some rebuttals. Let's get up and get started. He's just getting a laptop off the uh, thing. It's book how square we can. I just want to do it the way I know how to do it. Are you for progress, Jonathan? What I, Jonathan? Okay, uh, Tim, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I commend you on trying to find solutions to our energy uh, challenges of the 21st century. I uh, am in solidarity with you on that there's uh, something that we need to solve in a hurry. Uh, where I differ is when you use a racist, misogynist, classist, nationalist person who's reckless and is a shell game artist. When he talks about, okay, we have to use this uh, dirty, dirty energy, uh, we have to fix this dirty energy, we have to fix this dirty energy and make, make dirty energy no longer dirty because we can just, you know, words don't mean anything anymore. And then immediately within the same speech, and we heard it tonight, so I, I give you a lot of credit for playing that speech because I think that proves the, the, the pro-green deal, renewable energy deal uh, advocates uh, position very well. He follows it up with, we've had all these bad trade deals. Now what's wrong with that statement? It's true that we've had all these bad trade deals. But you know with his base, they're not very good with science and math. So when you follow up this, Clean coal is now clean, because I use the word clean in front of a microphone, and we have bad trade deals. It complicates how little time we have left to solve this problem. Time is of the essence, just like at a rebuttal of the College of Complexes. We don't have time to explain to 61 million Americans that honestly think that he's really good on math and science, that he's not. Okay, and you know, it complicates it, because even if you educated 61 million Americans that, uh, you know, all of a sudden this dirty energy, this or slightly less dirty energy in the 21st century and the 20th century uh, is suddenly clean, I still know it's going to be on the backs of poor people, on people of color, on women, on people who are immigrants. So it's still not the American way of solving a problem by saying, well, let's give this Carney Barker, uh, you know, a chance to get us on the right road because this right road now has a new vehicle to travel that road. You know, all the more reason why we should travel that right road with a guy who knows math and science and has basic American fundamental values in his platform. Yeah, when we talk capitalism talk instead of humanity speak, it's like talking about war. You know, you have to talk about war if you're a capitalist as if one military is going to win and one military is going to lose. You know, because all you can do is kill. 
You can't communicate when you think that war solves problems. And it's the same thing with energy in the 21st century. If you think that we have to profit everything instead of civilize, then you're already losing because you can't ever come to a solution that both will survive, both will avoid extinction, both will be sustainable, both will adapt to what the planet is clearly telling us, which is please, if you can't figure out nuclear energy, at least have all this money spent on birth control then, so we don't have more people than we can sustain. Yeah, clean coal. I just wanna, I think we have agreement on this, so this isn't a, a point of contention, but clean coal is like saying bloodless world war or casualty-less armed conflict between nation states. If I see one more thing about clean coal, and it wasn't just this president, it was the last one who used that phrase a lot in speeches, I just hear, can hear my dad in the Elysium Fields, a former nuclear physicist, losing his mind over this term, clean coal. Um, Tim, when the lights go out, because they're going to go out sometimes more with all these people in the United States and we still don't have a solution, you're going to need a survival kit. So I brought you a survival kit this evening. And, uh, good luck. Uh, this is a quote by George Bernard Shaw. Liberty means responsibility. That's why most dread it. My name is Raj Patel. Uh, Tim did a very good job. I think that this kind of presentation gives us lots of knowledge. When we agree or we disagree, but it was very informative, it was very clear, and this kind of presentation, this kind of programs, we should have more because it's that good. Thank you, Tim. Uh, when I was born, there was a kerosene lamp in a small room and I cried and nobody noticed but, but I mean uh, after other people were outside until I, until I got in the middle of the high school I studied on a kerosene lamp in my hometown uh, I the first 10 years of my life we, we used kerosene lamp everywhere you know we did not have a, no electricity and we did okay. And uh, lots of lots of people uh, in the world do not have electricity. Let, let, let's make that clear. In Africa, I saw one, one family there saw a video. They were using bicycle to have a light, temporary light, so that uh, some work had to be done, they can do it. In America also, in some places, it's hard to get light, still. So, so I'm not, I'm not, the, all the things you are talking about, uh, what energy is right, what energy is wrong, I'm not worried about that. You know why I'm not worried about that? <laughs> because I, I can blow lots of hot air. But uh, there are investors there, there are scientists there, there are control mechanism there, our government is working pretty good, you know. And do you know, we do, we do, more, more, we do more damage by wars then we have them with a nuclear or any kind of electricity, any kind of fuel. So, you know, let's, let's cool it. You know, and America is not doing bad. We have plenty of electricity. I think what we should worry about is that there are lots of underdeveloped countries, South and Africa and some Asia, that uh, we should help them get more electricity because energy is the prosperity, it's the economics. If they have more energy, we can do it. Don't end for whatever, it doesn't matter. It's a coal or gas or nuclear or whatever. Whatever, the, the more they have, they're going to stay there, they're not going to come here. But they will have prosperity, you know. And we train them to do this more. We are going to be better off, they are going to be better off. People coming here because they do not know, they don't have education, they do not have technology, they do not, they do not have capital, and we can help it. So that, that is a real real question. You know, India and China, we are going to have, we are going to have problem. They have no choice but to use coal. Because do you know what? They do not have uranium. And uh, the, the Western country is giving hard time to give a license to India to give import uranium. Okay? Now, Tim is saying that thorium, I'm not going to talk about it even because uh, Danis will talk about it and, and, and uh, other, we have done a lot, lot of discussion on that. 
But let, let, let's, be, let's be realistic, I am mean, you know, Where we can help, where citizen can help, but I mean, to be moralistic, come on, guys. You know, I mean, if you really, really solve problem, reduce population, uh, population of the earth by 50 percent, lots of problems will go away. That will help. But I mean, I don't want to do, nobody want to do it. You know, there are real solutions. You can, you can solve the problem, okay? I mean, don't stop using lots of garbage you are using. You know, start eating right, start cooking right, start buying right. You can help it. But I mean, you know, you know, you know, you know, you know, you know, you know what American wants is that. No, I have it done. No. no. What American, what American trying to do is that. Well, you know, I want everything morally right, everything environmentally right, everything, all people happy, all people uh, prosperous, everything. But don't ask me to take anything from me. I do not want to have any inconvenience. I do not want to have less light. No, use less light. I do not want to use uh, less food. I don't. I don't want to. I, I don't want to use meat and everything. So okay. Thank. Thank you very much. My time is up. Okay. But thank you. This is the way to do it. Uh, the one that's making fastest progress as, as far as solar, wind, so forth and so on, is China. Now China doesn't have a complete socialist system. It's a hybrid system, a mixture of capitalism and socialism. But at the same time, the capitalists really don't have no power, no um, economic power or political power. And in the United States, we have just the opposite, just capitalism itself, and the fossil fuel industries have made very heavy investments in in fossil fuels. So they're constantly using fossil fuels. And now, with our new backward president, they're trying to do away with all the things that Obama brought in. And he didn't really bring in that much to begin with. So we're having a lot of trouble. If you look on the West Coast, there's about 50 fires right now as we're talking and they can't do away with it and in the east you got flooding all over the place for instance in norfolk virginia which one of our biggest naval bases is becoming flooded over but nobody ever brings it up so if we keep going the way we're going we won't have a country under capitalism. That's the way it's moving. But in China, <laughs> things are moving in the opposite direction. For instance, they have bullet trains, so people only have to go in a car to travel from city to city or from one place to another, and that's saving a lot of fuel that pollutes. And what they're doing there, they have what they call green belts about 75 feet wide on either side of the bullet train. So you don't have that pollution. So the only way that we're going to make progress is not through the government. The government doesn't want to do anything, or most of it doesn't want to do anything. So we have to have movements, social movements, that are very big to push them in that direction. Nothing ever gets done in the United States unless you have people on the bottom pushing the politicians in a different direction. Like we had LBJ that uh, helped do away with some degree of prejudice against the blacks, gave more power. But he didn't do this because he loved blacks. He done it because there was mass movements. He had the, you had Dr. King and the rest of the other groups that were pushing him in that direction. So that's why it's done. 
if we want to do away with pollution completely, it'd probably take 50, 100 years, whatever it takes. We have to have a government that is not only believing in profits like ours, but believing in people. Okay. My name is Dennis R. Nelson, and I'm an energy environmental research writer, speaker, and organizer. I'm a member of the Chicago-based Nuclear Energy Information Service, NEIS. Thanks a lot for your presentation, Tim, and I'm going to do a little switcheroo on you. The ongoing discussion about whether or not it is feasible for us to have an electric electricity grid running on 100% renewables by 2050 often misses several key points. Number one, there are seven countries already at or very near 100% renewable electricity. Iceland, 100%. Paraguay, 100%. Costa Rica, 99%. Norway, 98.5%. Austria, 80%. Brazil, 75%. And Denmark, 69.4%. The main renewables in these nations are hydropower, wind, geothermal, and solar. Number two, there are also many larger population areas at or above 100%, including two regions in Germany, New Zealand, South Island, and Denmark, Samso Island. Both the provinces of uh, Quebec and British Columbia in Canada are at nearly 100% renewable electricity. Last summer, the Qinghai province in China ran seven straight days to tally on renewables, wind, solar, and hydro. Bloomberg New Energy Finance has projected that by 2040, Germany's grid will be almost 75% renewables, Mexico will be over 80% renewables, and Brazil and Italy will be over 95%. A study in May of this year concluded that Indonesia has far more than enough pumped hydro storage sites to support a 100 percent renewable energy grid and look at this uh, a, a 2015 report said that despite its overuse of nuclear power France could have hundred percent renewable electricity by 2050 this can be done by quickly developing wind solar and hydro dr. Mark Z Jacobson a civil and environmental engineering professor at Stanford University and a senior fellow at the Precourt Institute for Energy at Stanford University was the leader of a study released during August of last year, which identified how 139 countries around the world could obtain 100% of their energy from renewable sources, wind, water, and solar by 2050. Dr. Jacobson and his colleagues at the University of California, Berkeley, and Augsburg University in Denmark are back with a newer study in February of this year. It concludes that 100% renewable energy with grid stability is possible and economical. This roadmap to 100% renewable energy breaks those 139 nations into 20 regions and proposes energy storage solutions uniquely suited to each region. There are multiple solutions to make the grid stable so that larger penetrations of renewables can keep the grid stable at low cost. Continuing on, the wind turbines needed would reduce human-caused climate disruption by about 3% and quickly. Jim, you never mentioned the U.S. grid study by pro-nuclear and pro-coal Secretary of Energy Rick Perry. Now, this study might have stumbled upon two solutions to make America going 100% renewable. Perry in his grid study is how electric cars and smart controls will enable deeper penetration of solar and wind. Also very deep in the report is the fact that renewables help stabilize prices and make our electric bills more manageable. As a researcher, I find that the data and projections about 100% renewable electricity grid make up one of the most interesting aspects of energy environmental policy today. But a lot of the general public would probably be poured to tears just hearing about it or think that it's simply too technical to understand. What, what comes with this big challenge is a great opportunity. As an activist as well, I know that we have to get active. People must be empowered to act in their own best interest. That, besides enhancing our energy security, a 100% renewable electricity grid will also promote our economic well-being, healthier lifestyles, ecological sustainability, and climate protection. People must be persuaded to commit to this process, and this is where the hard work will begin and we need everybody's help. 
Uh, thanks a lot, and I'm looking forward to Tim's response. Yeah, t what's this? Yeah. What's this? Fuzzy yeah. man. Yeah. Yeah. Come yeah. over to the future. They're 100% renewables. Fuzzy man. He just gave me the list. I know. Ah, why are countries 100%? I've been having my eyes on this renewable energy thing for the last 30 years, and we're in transition right now. Oh, wind. Oh, well, but that's not doesn't blow all the time. If you have a big section of the country, yeah, it blows pretty much all the time. Don't worry about it. Solar and wind, cheaper than coal. Coal plants are going down. They're being closed down. Germany, uh, they, they've had some nuclear plants. They're closing them down. They don't need them anymore. So the shift is happening now. And if you uh, travel to Indiana? Yes. Have you noticed anything? It's, this is a few years ago now. Yeah. Uh, Indiana, a few years ago, didn't have any wind energy at all. Didn't have anything. It now has the largest wind farm in the Midwest. Oh. You know who put it up? Pretty's Petroleum. It's, it's, it, it's a matter of, if you want to do something, you can do it. And the move is toward renewable energy. You can see the problems that we're, we're having to face, uh, like Boston, New York City, Washington, D.C., Baltimore, Miami. They're going to be underwater. You don't hear anything about it. At some point, they, they must know about this. I don't know what they're going to do. No, no far, they don't have to worry about it. The Navy ships, they can float. All I can say is the transition has happened. You know what the largest electric car producer in the uh, world is? Germany. China. China. Germany. Think, things are happening now. Uh, we, we don't need, uh, for him is nice, but we don't need it. All right. Well, I'm glad Mr. Nelson back there brought up all this. You know, there's some fuzzy math going on here. How come these other countries have 100%, 90% renewables, and we're only capable of 6 or 8%? Something strange is going on here. You know, I don't trust the facts and figures. Look at this liar Trump. 4,000 lies in a year and a half and counting. He's, he's number one. You know, so I don't trust that. Everything's got to, we need charts and graphs and everything else now because we really got to verify everything. Tim, I don't, I don't know if that's right. Something is not making sense. If we're at 6% renewables and Germany's at 90%, something is weird, okay? So check on that. And I got a question for all you folks since you guys are big into energy. And, yeah, I know. What percentage do you think of the American corn crop goes into our gas tanks? A lot. A lot. I'm not sure what Because I heard some right-wing Republican Nebraska congressman rah, rah, how our corn is feeding the world. Take a guess what percentage of our corn goes into the gas tanks. That's 80. 30. Okay, right. It's up to 40. It's going ahead and towards 50 yeah. percent. So when they t when you think that this corn is going to feed the pigs and cows and chickens, half of it is going to uh, burn in the SUVs and everything like that. Anyway, good job, Tim. Uh, something there's some something's not making sense here with Dennis Nelson's figures, these other countries, and then us being so lame. And I still think Wall Street is not going to let your thorium move forward because, you know, Wall Street is big oil, big natural gas, and big coal, and they're going to they're pay off the politicians. They want them to burn that crap. Thank you. Good night. Okay. Next. He's an oil, he's a big oil guy.
I'm right. a big oil guy. Okay, uh, my name is Andy Anderson. I'm from the Northwest Information Service in Palatine. And some of you have attended some of my talks over the last decade on censored news and how the media in America promote certain things and they suppress other things. So, so we have Americans living in a bubble of mythology on several different subjects. If we had investigative reporters that were actually investigating like they used to 40 or 50 years ago, we wouldn't be having a talk like this tonight or we wouldn't be having a debate. Like right now, there's no debate anymore about whether or not the Catholic Church had a pedophile priest problem. We used to debate that a while back, but not anymore. People, are, we're all on the same page. <clears throat> There's some things that the press doesn't cover that are game changers for nuclear energy. Number one, I'll just list these things real quick. Number one, nuclear power plants are uninsured and uninsurable. No insurance company anywhere writes insurance on these things, like what happened to Chernobyl, Fukushima, Three Mile Island. It's left to the taxpayers to absorb the cost of the disaster because one disaster can wipe out an insurance company. Number two, a nuclear power plant is the greatest Ruth Goldberg machine in the world to boil water. That's what it is. And if everything doesn't work perfectly, then the water doesn't get boiled. You have a problem. As you go up in complexity in any machine, you have more opportunities for breakdown. In order to promote nuclear power of any kind, you have to ignore the other kind of nuclear power from a fusion reactor that's already in existence. There's a giant fusion reactor out there, 93 million miles away, and it ships the energy to us every day in free energy and light. Right? We get free energy. We get 10,000. Remember this factor, people. 10,000 times more light falls on the planet every day than what the human race would use every day in energy. We collect one ten thousandth of the light with solar, and you wouldn't need wind, geothermal, wave power, or anything else. We are awash in all kinds of renewable energy that is vastly cheaper than building any kind of new nuclear power plant. In this book, 1980, Adam's Eve, there's an article in here called The Ultimate Trojan Horse. And he said any, any state, any nation that has a group of nuclear power plants running on their home soil can be rendered uninhabitable for humans any time a group of terrorists want to blow up those plants with small, portable nuclear weapons. And incidentally, in November of 1975, the decision was made to risk letting uh, uh, some American city be third after Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And on Union Oil product out in Los Angeles, Union Oil property, they got an atomic bomb threat. And the nuclear emergency search team in the U.S. government said, don't tell the people about the hunt until the, time, until the day we don't find one of these things before it goes off. When we lose a chunk of the city, then we got to tell the American public that there's a problem with nuclear power, because that's where the material comes from. The nuclear power and nuclear weapons industry are intertwined worldwide. The time element, the, um, talking about solving our climate crisis, which is going to be out of control in five years, virtually all climate experts around the planet now recognize we have about five years to mount a World War II type mobilization to get off burning, burning fossil fuels. If we don't do that, then it, uh, it won't matter what form of energy we use after the next 10, 15 years because our coastal cities are going to be underwater by 2050, 2060. That's how fast the ice is melting, and it's happening. We have to start burning, stop burning fossil fuel, and those fuels have to be left in the ground. The last thing, I was where Tim is now. I was once a strong proponent of nuclear power, just like there were a lot of people that were strong proponents of the Catholic priests that they didn't know were molesting the kids. After you step through the psychological barrier and learn that, you can't go back. Once you start reading a few simple things, 
about uh, simple things about nuclear power that are universally understood, like what happened at Fukushima. That's poisoning the planet, not just Japan. The radioactivity from the air, water, and ground is drifting around the world from Fukushima. It's a disaster of biblical proportions. So the only hope we have is to save the money we spend on the next generation of nuclear power and put up cheap renewable sources of all kinds. Incidentally, solar panels are down under a dollar a watt now. <clears throat> That's uh, a fourth of the cost of building any new nuclear plant at all. A fourth or a fifth, maybe a tenth. And then, as I said, it's fusion power coming out of 93 million miles away. The fusion reactor is already there. It's been running for eons. Pretty strange. It's, yeah. it's safe. Then we don't have any pollution from it. Why are we trying to develop fusion here on Earth when we got free fusion power bathing us every day, 24 hours a day, it's falling on the Earth? Okay? So that, that's it for my talk for tonight. Thank you. Okay. All right. Tim, you didn't get that, so. Oh, First of all, Tim, I'd like to thank you for an excellent presentation. I didn't agree with all of it, but I agree with most of it. And you did an excellent job. Um, some might find your, your thorium ideas controversial. I'm going to leave that to people who are more expert than I am. <laughs> I would say that somebody mentioned liquid sodium reactors. In the 50s, when the U.S. Navy began to operate nuclear submarines for the first time, the second submarine that they built was the USS Seawolf. And if I have my facts right, and I think I do, when that went into service, that had a liquid sodium reactor in there. And they ran into two problems. It leaked. And it produced this blue radiation glow all over the place. And they decided, no, this isn't going to work. And they took out the liquid sodium reactor and they put in a newer, they put in a different reactor, uh, identical to the one that had been used in the first nuclear sub, the Nautilus, uh, which had been more successful. It is important to remember that the Seawolf was constructed as a test bed so they could test out various means of nuclear propulsion and see how well they worked. And well, the first one, well, it didn't work, folks. So they went to something else. So some of you are dissatisfied out there with Donald Trump and want him removed from office. Well, I didn't used to be for that because I felt that presidents should be removed from office not simply well, because you dislike them, and I hate Trump, but whether or not they threaten the safety of the American people. And I didn't think Trump quite did that. Then came Helsinki. And at Helsinki, Trump either committed an act of treason there or did something very close to it. And at this point, the only reason why I do not favor his immediate removal of office, as some of the hotheads do, is that this is a Republican Congress we've got here, folks. And do you really think that you're going to get Republican votes to impeach him? I don't think so. Instead, I agree with Nancy Pelosi to this extent. It is necessary to elect as many Democrats as possible this fall to Congress. Because if you get a Democratic Congress this fall, then all things are possible. And in January, the first order of business after Congress convenes is to impeach that son of a bitch and remove him from mm. office. But until then, it's not going to be possible. And so what I want to send a clear message to some of the more radical people here in the room. Some of them the last time in the last election said, oh, let's vote for Jill Stein or somebody like that. Now, it is true that Hillary contributed and her followers, including me, got cocky and overconfident and as a result contributed to our own defeat. Some of it was caused by the people who decided that they were either Bernie or Bust people or decided they were going to vote for Jill Stein or whoever. We can't afford to have this again. Do you want Democrats in there who will impeach Donald Trump and remove him from office, or don't you? So there's going to be no room in this election for folks who decide, well, I don't like Mike Quigley, and I'm going to vote for that Green Party candidate. Sorry. Again, do you want Donald Trump removed, or don't you? We need enough Democrats elected to Congress to do the job. And there isn't any going to be any room this fall for third-party voting or for any of that crap. 
have to make do with what you've got. No. And get rid of Donald Trump. You don't. Thank you. Yes, you do. Iceland. This isn't Iceland here. That's the point. He wants out of office, or don't you? That's exactly the point. The blue wave. The blue wave. Uh, all right. Do you want Trump out of office or not? He's got the only way. Oh, Wait until it comes out that Trump is not the authentic president of the United States and the Russian interference in the elections was a lot greater than anybody knows right now. <laughs> and you'll get Republican votes from each of I'll be eclectic as usual. Let's thank our speaker. Very good. One thing I noticed in coming here on the bus, I saw uh, some bicycle installation. I guess now they got motor electric bicycles and they have solar panels using off-the-shelf technology. I also know on the railroad they use off-the-shelf technology, solar technology for the signaling systems. Uh, very simple to operate as Andy was talking about there. Uh, another thing, be jumping around anything that's radioactive for 400 years fulfills the criteria for me of being very dangerous. <laughs> I don't know what safe is, but 400 years is sufficiently radioactive to, I think, cause some harm to Charles. Uh, regarding extraordinary claims, you know, I gave a little talk here using covers of the popular science magazine, which is noted for extraordinary claims. And we kept hearing these one after another. This seems to be the modus operandi of the Dorian crowd here. Now, as a young man, very quite young, my uncle, uh, I was employed there. I visited Oak Ridge, Tennessee. And I remember in the museum very specifically all sorts of claims there was going to be a passenger ship that could travel around the world, the globe. 50 times or 500 years and never be refueled. And I so remember this. They even said there was a piece of chicken there, a piece of chicken like you get at Colonel Sanders at Popeyes. And they said that was five years old. And you wouldn't need to refrigerate food anymore, you know. Uh, well, we still have refrigeration here. Anyhow, uh, one of the things about the Greek field to mention is there's terrorists. I just saw the news today. There's terrorists working on the computer systems, and that's their number one target, for which Trump is making no preparation whatsoever. What, what's going on here? That's what really concerns me. The other thing about these energy devices, for many, many years on Earth Day, we had Ed Ponder. Ed Butler remembers them. Uh, he came here and he had a device that you could, for some reason, you could throw an old couch in and he would crank it up and do do do, and out would come gasoline. <laughs> he also was working on a home version that you could put it, you could put in your garage and make your own gasoline, you know. But he never quite got it working. And the last I heard of Ed, he was at, he was trying to interest the government into some sort of offshore atmospheric energy device and things like this, you know. But. Uh, no, I think uh, uh, I'll go with the, uh, uh, the, the the technology that shows me the greatest promise and has already given application versus something here that is just one one sequence of of of, of, of uh, big rock candy mountain promises. You know, that's what what it is and uh, sugarcoating that surface radiation or something. We're talking about radiation, man. And I, all this, this, this distraction is like someone like Trump does, you know, spin. It's kind of like spin on something that's dangerous. I don't buy into that. Anyhow, yeah, thanks a lot. Good luck. See you again. Okay. Yeah, the thorium spin. I just want to give a quick 10 second response. Uh, candidates from the third parties in 2016, nor Bernie Sanders cost Hillary Clinton the election in this state, which we live in, Illinois. Last time I checked, she won the presidency in this state. So it's scapegoating to the nauseating degree of an, a year and a half later, once again, getting sidetracked when we say, it's your fault. It's not.
Well, his point is that we have it's to fill her. He doesn't have a point. Yeah, yeah, yeah he he might. Don't make any difference. Yeah, 30 seconds on that. Uh, what we've been seeing in the news is Russia, 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 Russia. It's a carnival uh, atmosphere to take our attention away from That's right. gerrymandering, vote suppression, computer generated vote switching after we go to bed. Our st uh, we've had stolen elections in this country shifted to the red. It's always a red shift to keep Republican criminals in office after we vote them out. And that, that red shift began when Bush and Cheney were installed in 2000. They lost, they shifted the totals, said we won. We voted them out in 2004. They changed the vote totals in 11 states after we went to bed after the Las Vegas odds makers called it. So start talking about election theft from the good old boys that own the Republican uh, voting uh, electronic machines. That's what those machines are for, to change vote totals after we go to bed. And we won't get a change in this country unless, who said it, we have to turn out to the polls in mass, so that in large enough numbers that they can't, can't steal it. And there's a blue wave happening nationwide. More and more. I praise Trump. This will be the only time you see if I've been praising Donald Trump on one thing for 20 years or uh, 20 months. He's the greatest wake-up call this country's ever had. <laughs> so, my own, uh, Tim, uh, who's uh, coming up to anybody? Uh, Tim gets the last word. It's time. Come on up, Tim. Yeah. <laughs> I know I'm not going to change anybody's mind tonight about nuclear power or why I believe thorium is the best way. I know that if we could power the world with renewables, maybe it might be a better way to go. And I am going to go look at Dennis Nelson's uh, figures. Because what I did at the last Thorium Energy Alliance conference is they addressed that very topic and said it was impractical and basically most of those countries that are 100% renewables have a large reliance on hydroelectric power. Um, Dennis, you, you're, you've given me some food for thought tonight. I am going to take a look at it and, 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 and see. What I'm saying right now is I firmly believe that really the only way we're going to get off climate change and get off oil is to use an equivalent or even better power source than we've had than in the past. That's nuclear. And I believe if that if you're a real environmentalist, nuclear is going to be part of the option. If you want to stop burning fossil fuels, you're going to need a lot more power than what renewables right now are capable of. That's why I fundamentally support the nuclear option. If we don't look at this stuff, somebody else will, and we'll be licensing that technology from them. It's not like I did it. I hope that tonight you did get some education about not just the thorium part, but about the grid, how our electricity is made, and I hope I made some sufficient arguments for the use of nuclear and other sources of power. And I, my firm goal tonight was just to educate you about the grid and the various sources of power. And I know I had a lot of heavy reliance on video because I think with all the technical information presented, it did a lot better job than I could with trying to present it with charts and graphs. Sometimes a minute video to explain a concept is a lot easier than it would be me just talking. I again thank you guys for attending. I enjoy the challenge of giving a good speech. Let's thank Karina again for videotaping tonight. Let's give a warm thank you for Charlie because he's the one who's still keeping this place organized. With that, Jonathan Barton, he wanted he said, When the lights go out, you're going to need a survival kit. So I gave you a green survival kit. Give you a flashlight. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Atomic flashlight.